Um, yeah, so as, as Patricia said, I am a postdoc uh, in Torsten Schwede group at the Biozentrum of the University of Basel. And um, I would like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit how we are leveraging the deep learning revolution to study uh, the diversity of the protein universe. So finding a new biology in catalog proteins, but also unknown evolutionary relationships and how deep learning uh, and did this revolution in, in uh, by applying deep learning to structural biology, uh, how it helps us um, having a much clearer view of what we know about proteins. So we know from classic biochemistry classes or molecular biology that uh, life is a re the result of the interplay of multiple macromolecules and that proteins play a very big role in, 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 in life being as it is right now because they build most of the machines of the cell and they are found across uh, all kingdoms of life. They are essential and they are everywhere. They are inside of the cell. They are in the membranes. They are outside. They have a wide diversity of functions. And this relates of course to their single amino acid sequence and their 3D shapes. But if we look at uh, protein databases like Uniprot, uh, there's about 250 million unique protein coding sequences that we know, and they are the result of sequencing over 500,000 organisms, again, across the tree of life. And when we look at how much we know about them, especially how what are their names and which kind of annotations are over these proteins, we see that roughly 60% um, are fully annotated because they were experimentally characterized or because there's homologs that were experimentally characterized. And then there's about 20% that have just very ambiguous names like uncharacterized protein, the protein of a non-function, hypothetical protein, and there's no annotations for them. So we don't know just from their single page what they are and what they may be doing. And this is a relatively large fraction, 20%. And uh, it's large, but it's biased. Um, there's much more we know about specific organisms or the proteins in specific organisms than others. So if you look at the human proteome, um, this little brown uh, uh, purple bar, uh, it goes up to just 7%. Of course, from a, a human biology perspective, from a medical perspective, it's a relatively large number. It's about 7% of the proteins in encoded by the human genome, we don't know what they do. But if we go to the environment, uh, for example, to, mar to especially to marine uh, environments, there's a much higher fraction of such proteins. For example, this um, cyanobacteria, Sinecococcus, uh, it's about 30% of the proteins encoded by, uh, by their genome. Uh, they cannot be annotated and they just named hypothetical proteins. So the question is, well, what is hidden in these proteins? Why, why are they so poorly annotated? Is it because they uh, are just you know, remote versions of proteins that we already know what they do, but they just go beyond or just are just beyond the detection horizon of classic homology-based approaches? Or more importantly, and also more interestingly from my perspective, uh, that they pro may correspond to new biology that we don't know what it does, especially if, when it comes to pathogens or uh, organisms that live in us, like uh, species from our microbiome. And this could be that these proteins are just completely new interactors or different mechanisms that these organisms have that we just don't know about them. So it would be really interesting and really important to uh, come up with ways of shedding lights into these unknowns. So defining which ones could be responding to new biology and which ones are just very distant uh, homologs of proteins of non-function. And to do that, um, I like to use the analogy of the protein universe. This is not something that I came up with, uh, but it's a, a concept that I really like uh, and that basically drives all the research that I do now. Uh, so if we think about uh, the diversity of proteins that could be constructed from an alphabet of 20 amino acids, it's there's basically an infinite number of possibilities. And we can see 
these possibilities as a very large landscape of possible protein sequences. And of course, within these are those that nature sampled. And this, so these are like galaxies in uh, or stars in, in this universe. And those that are uh, functionally annotated are bright stars because we can see them, we know what they do. And so protein families would be clusters of, of, uh, of, of, um, of proteins, so clusters of stars, so galaxies, and, um, and super families would be clusters of galaxies all dispersed throughout the space, surrounded by these dark regions of protein sequences that nature could sample, but so far didn't or we just don't know it did. So if we think from a structural perspective, what we do or when we do when we're characterizing this space and we're looking at um, characterizing proteins experimentally, what typically one does is you, you select one star in one galaxy and then characterize it experimentally. In the case of structures, you could solve the structure of it. And then using homology-based approaches, you expand the annotations to the rest of the galaxy and also maybe <clears throat> the super galaxy. And um, this means that we are only able to annotate or extend by homology uh, the information to those galaxies or super galaxies that have at least one element that is experimentally um, uh, characterized. Of course, there's also some cases where we don't have structure and these galaxies still remain uh, bright, uh, but we just don't have uh, structures. Now, thanks to the deep learning revolution, uh, we now have access to structural information from basically the entire catalog of proteins in Uniprot. And this is thanks to AlphaFold, which was introduced this morning. So what they did uh, after uh, AlphaFold was out, they took the entire Uniprot, or at least a big fraction of Uniprot, and uh, predicted structures for all of these proteins. This means that they predicted structures for proteins that, could, that have already structural characterized members, fine, good. Uh, also, also for those bright ones that don't have structural information, so those proteins or those galaxies that correspond to families, then we know what they do, but we just don't know how they look in 3D. But more importantly, they also predicted structures for those uncharacterized hypothetical proteins. And so these are now the cases that we can um, now, uh, I mean, now there's all of this information that we can try to learn something about those proteins of a non-function that, um, that I introduced in the beginning. So what we did then was to leverage all of this information. So the annotation information in Uniprot, uh, the pre-computed clusters that Uniprot provides, which is called Uniref, and the structural information in the AlphaFold database to model this landscape, uh, at least as covered by uh, the AlphaFold database. So very simply, this is a bit of a, of a, a complex slide, but in, in very, simple terms, uh, what, uh, what I did was to take the pre-computed clusters of sequences from UNIREF 50. So what UNIREF 50 is, is um, it took um, in the entire sequences from UNIPROD and also some uh, from UNIPARC and cluster them based on sequence similarity. And UNIREF 50 is a sequence similarity of 50%. So all proteins that are inside of the same cluster, they have at minimum 50% sequence identity or, yeah. And uh, between clusters, between cluster representatives, you would expect that there would be a, a, a maximum of 50% sequence identity. And then for each of these clusters, for all of the elements in the clusters, I checked, collected all the annotations that are available for these members and then um, stored that in the database. And then for each cluster, I looked what is the protein that is the most well annotated for domains, but also predicted uh, structural features like coil coiled and, and disordered prediction and it ignored all those annotations that correspond to domains of a non-function, hypothetical domains, putative domains, because these are those that would be dark, right? We know this should be a domain, but we don't know exactly what it does, uh, or if it does what we predict it does. And so 
this coverage with annotations, we named it uh, the functional brightness. So the more uh, well annotated full coverage a protein is, the brighter it is. And so as by selecting the one that is the best annotated for a UNR50 cluster, we're then selecting the one that is the brightest. And so a UNR50 cluster would be as bright as the brightest of the protein. In, in its cluster. So if there's a cluster where none of the proteins is well annotated, it's no annotations in the full protein, so it would be a brightness of zero. So these are dark unir 50 clusters. So after having this complete annotated set um, of unir 50 clusters, what then uh, the idea it would was was to take all of the members of these, um, all of the representatives of these clusters and construct a sequence similarity network that's uh, based on local uh, sequence homology. And this we could do using different metrics, but the first one we tried just because this was a principle of con was a, um, um, uh, we're trying to 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 uh, develop the approach. We used MM6, which is really fast uh, to deal with very large sets of sequences, um, and then we're able to construct uh, an, a network. Now, one uh, important thing is that we didn't construct the network for the entire AlphaFold database because that corresponds to about 250 million proteins. Uh, this means 50 million UNIRA 50 clusters. And there's um, uh, the distribution of model confidence throughout the AlphaFold database is not so high. Uh, or, well, it, it varies. It, there's high, but it varies a bit. So we decided to focus first on those uh, UNIRA 50 clusters where there was uh, at least one member uh, in the cluster that was model, modeled at the really high accuracy, predicted accuracy with alpha fold, so a PLDDT over 90. And this reduced um, the set to about 50 million proteins, which is about 6 million uh, inner F50 clusters. So that was easier to deal with. Still pretty large and the largest ever um, um, set to use uh, to construct such a network. So it's still the largest uh, that uh, we were able to construct. Uh, but we have to bear in mind this only corresponds to about um, yeah uh, ten percent, fifteen percent of all the proteins. But what we could see, uh, and this is the network that we constructed, is here on on the right, uh, is that uh, we can um, find different regions where the dark um, UNIR50 clusters, so our dark proteins that we don't know what they do, uh, how they are distributed in the network. And we could see different regions where they are. So for example, we find clusters like uh, here on the on the left, cluster one, uh, where all the proteins, all the UNIR50 clusters in this cluster uh, are all very well annotated. So this is a completely bright cluster, and this corresponds to a family of lipid carriers. But then you also have those cases where all of the UNIR50 clusters are dark. So there's no protein in these UNIR50 clusters that are well annotated. Uh, and all of them form a cluster by themselves that don't connect to any bright ones. And so these would correspond to what we call like the unknown protein families. Of course, you can also have those where there's a mix. Uh, there's a mix of UNIR50 clusters that are well annotated with some that are a little bit less annotated and then a little bit less annotated in a gradient as here in the mixed clusters um, uh, uh, labeled uh, region. And these are those cases where those dark proteins, those uh, non-annotated proteins just correspond to remote homologs, very remote homologs of bright ones. And thanks to including all of the intermediate, uh, evolutionary intermediate sequences, we could find a path that connects those dark, different, uh, difficult to annotate proteins to their uh, member, to their relatives that are functionally characterized or functionally annotated. And uh, what we also saw from this uh, cluster, from this network, is that it's actually a rich source of new and un un unknown protein families. We found a really large number of uh, clusters where 
everything is purple, everything is dark. Another thing that I also wanted to point out about our network, and you can see when looking into it, is that there's a middle where everything is interconnected. This is the what I call the, the middle blob uh, or the inner blob. And this corresponds to about 50% of our uh, set in uh, of, of sequences here. So these correspond to unary 50 clusters that clustered together, but also have some kind of local homology to other in the ref 50 clusters. And this, you can think about it a bit as uh, you have um, local shared motifs that are being shared between proteins. So we know that proteins, em new proteins emerge by the shuffling of, pro and of already defined protein domains, right? And so if you have protein with domain A and B, and then another one with B and C, and then with C and D, of course, these will be connected because A and B will connect to B and C, and then, then this one then will be connected to the other one. So you have this, um, this network of shared uh, local motifs between different families. But then you have this the remaining 50%, which is this ridge here, which everything is purple, uh, which are those single individual families that don't have any obvious similarity to anything else that we know. And these would be those cases that correspond most likely to completely new protein families uh, that now we can leverage the structural information from the AlphaFold database to learn something about. It. So one example, is this cluster 159 that I showed in the beginning. Um, this cluster has uh, proteins mostly from prokaryotes. So there's sequences from uh, archaea and from bacteria. And what I show here on the left is the predictive structure as uh, of AlphaFold. And now when uh, taking this predictive structure and search it against the, uh, the PDB, so the protein data bank, which has all of the uh, experimental protein structures um, up to date, they're deposited there. We could, I did a, a structure search against the alpha and, and against the PDB, and I didn't find anything that looked like it. So this would suggest it's a completely new predicted fold. And, and so I can also not learn from close of proteins that look similar, um, I could not learn from those in the PDB. So then what I did was to leverage uh, the methods that use uh, protein structures to predict uh, Go terms. And this, um, this method that I used is called DeepFry. It's um, a neural network that was trained based on structural information to predict Go terms, so gene ontology terms. Um, that relate to function. And then as a side result of how the network was trained, you, it also provides you which uh, residues contribute the most to this prediction. So uh, indicate a, a possible uh, place in the protein where the predicted act activity occurs. And I got two different predictions using this method. Uh, one is DNA binding, and the residues in red are those that um, contributed the most to that prediction. And I got also a prediction on hydrolase activity acting on ester bonds, and those uh, residues are in, in red uh, are uh, those that contributed for that prediction. So this would suggest some kind of hydrolase activity over DNA or some kind of nucleic acid. Um, then what uh, I did was to dig a bit further into, into this possible family, um, try to understand if it's a family, if this cluster is a family or a super family, and how different the members of the, the super family were, are. So I collected, uh, uh, I collected an enriched set of sequences uh, homologous to the, the proteins in this cluster and constructed, again, a sequence similarity network for just these sequences. And this is what we see here in the middle. Um, and what you can see is that there are uh, at least seven different clusters of proteins that that come that form basically seven different families. And so this cluster 159 actually corresponds to a super family. And as these proteins are all in prokaryotes, I could also learn from the genomic context uh, where these proteins are encoded uh, about if they are in a possible operon or if they may interact with some or be co-transcribed with some other uh, proteins. 
And what uh, I saw was that by using the, the sequences in the different clusters as input for uh, genomic context and anal analyzing tools like GCSNAP or, or FLAGS, um, I saw that the members of different clusters uh, were um, are encoded next to different uh, protein coding genes, but always with a concerned feature, which is a bisestronic um, uh, arrangement. So it means these proteins, members from cluster 159 and members from each of these families here uh, annotated in, in the, the sequence uh, network that I showed here in the middle. And so each member uh, would come, would always be with another gene conserved um, across all of the, those genomes. They would be always with another gene, uh, but this partner gene was different uh, between the different families uh, that make the 159 superfamily. And all of these were also hypothetical proteins. None of them were annotated. So all of them were dark too, are dark actually. And in one case, actually, uh, the, the, our 159 target uh, was actually fused with another domain, which is also a domain of unknown function. The only one that could give us some hints was uh, the, the the partner of the members in cluster one, uh, A, B, and C, and cluster six, which is an homolog of a uh, RELB protein. And this is an antitoxin. And indeed, this bisestronic arrangement is very characteristic of toxin antitoxin systems, where there's a toxic effector that uh, would kill the bacteria, but uh, it would be encoded uh, or would be transcribed exactly at the same time with the antidote, which would neutralize the toxin. And so if there's some kind of stress, for example, phage infection, uh, the antitoxin would unblock the toxin and would lead to the death of the bacteria in order to try to prevent uh, the entire population from being infected by phages. Um, and so this, uh, um, in collaboration with uh, a ta a Professor Tanya Tansen in uh, Tartu and uh, Vasili in, in uh, Lund, um, they did uh, some experiments on this and, and validated this hypothesis, which is that um, this uh, bisestronic operon that we saw is a toxin antitoxin system. So here on, on the right, what you see is the experiments that they uh, carried out. The, on top is the toxic, toxicity uh, neutralization assays. So having E. coli um, uh, expressing only the toxin, uh, well, it's not happy, so it dies um, because, well, that means this may ha have some kind of toxic effect over E. coli. But when it expresses also the uh, the cognate, so the RELB-like protein, uh, there's a, a recovery of the phenotype and the, the, the uh, oh, there's a recovery and E. coli is happy to live, which means that the cognate uh, is um, neutralizing the effect of, of the toxin, which is our 159. And uh, when doing a metabolic labeling, they saw there's a reduction in the incorporation of methionine, but no reduction in the incorporation of um, uridine or timidine, which means that there's a reduction in protein production, uh, which then suggests that uh, the, our members of uh, cluster 159 have a translation targeting uh, toxins in prokaryotes. Another example is cluster 3314. 3, uh, this is an interesting example for a completely different reason, uh, which is all of these proteins from this uh, cluster have completely different predicted names. <laughs> um, they would be hypothetical uh, in the beginning when we started our work, but in the meantime, their name changed. And I will show you why in, in the next slide, but their name changed. Um, uh, they, so they they completely have new new assigned names, and when we looked at the distribution of names within them, they were all over the place. They were they were going from uh, prophage protein to uh, NAD H quinone oxidoreductase um, to integrase, so things that were not really related to each other. 
Uh, and we didn't find any clear uh, homology to anything known. Even at the structure level, we found some hits, some tubulin binding domain, uh, but the, at the sequence level, we could not really see a clear relationship between them. And when looking at the genomic context, there was really no conserved genomic context between the members uh, of these cluster. But uh, when looking at the distribution of the, which kind of genes were around it, we saw that there were many proteins that are somehow associated with prophages. So this indicates that, pro, that prophage protein title may be correct, but we still don't know what this though. Uh, but the what this is really interesting about it is this diversity of names because they uh, are the result of using um, a language models to predict names of unknown uh, of proteins of unknown function or hypothetical proteins. So since uh, about last year, yeah, the end of last year, uh, Uniprot started using a language model, ProtNLM, to uh, predict names for hypothetical proteins. And so this is a language model that was trained on all the names and sequences of proteins well studied in the Uniprot. And then uh, I was asked to predict, given a, a protein sequence, to predict a name for it. But our hypothesis back then was that, well, if this would work really well for those proteins that are remote homologs of, uh, or those hypothetical proteins that are remote homologs of proteins of known function. But if it's a completely new biological system that has no characterized homologs, then what would these language models do? We know that language models, um, they have a bit of an ability of hallucinate uh, things when you ask them something that they don't know anything about. There was this discussion uh, a few months ago about ChatGPT, for example. So we were, we had this hypothesis that maybe this language model would, given true, completely unknown protein families, would hallucinate their names, would give a wide diversity of names to these members. And so that we could probably distinguish between those dark galaxies that correspond to completely new uh, protein families uh, from those that are just remote homologs of, of really well-studied protein families based on the distribution of names that are predicted. So this is what we, we did. So we tested this hypothesis. We took all of those dark galaxies in our network and uh, checked what, were, what was the diversity of words that were used um, uh, or that were predicted uh, for the names of its members and compared to those in those that are completely fluidly bright, so really well studied. And we saw that there was um, a clear separation that there's the dark uh, galaxies have a higher tendency to have a wider diversity of names than those that are bright. And so we put a cut at 20% um, at uh, word diversity and uh, this corresponds to about 290 of our galaxies and then teamed up with, with the PFAM team, so with, with Tony and Alex and the PFAM at the EBI, um, which are uh, bio curators and they define the families in PFAM. So we gave them the sets of sequences and they started curating them and saw that indeed um, all of the most of these uh, dark galaxies were completely new um, dark families that had not even a duff associated to them, and so now they are new. Um, they are assigned in PFAM at least to a duff. They could remain dark, but at least there's a family attributed to them. Uh, and this is a good example on how doing these large scale approaches and using uh, by knowing how these deep learning methods work how we could take a pitfall of the method and use it in our, in our, at our uh, benefit. Uh, and of course, now also the way that this language model used to predict names in, in, in Uniprot has changed slightly. You now uh, there's some more conservative thresholds. So if they don't have this so much of this hallucination. Now, as I said, we we are leveraging first those that uh, those proteins that have high predicted accuracy structures in the AlphaFold database. So with their structures, we could also do um, clustering at the structural level. We didn't do that because it was also someone else who was doing that. And so I 
completely recommend you that if you're interested in this topic uh, to check out the alpha fold clusters uh, done by the Beltran and Steinager labs. What uh, and they they the, the, this was published at the same time as our as our work and is a really nice resource to find proteins clustered at the structural level and then you can see how different clusters also relate to each other. What is the, similar clusters to the protein you're interested in. So it's a really, really interesting resource. What we did instead uh, to look at structures was to uh, leverage um, the these predicted uh, folds to try to find which ones uh, could correspond to unusual folds. I see there is a question in the chat, but I don't see my mouse, so I cannot select it, but maybe we can, can discuss yeah. I can read through how yeah. to uncover the unknown protein which contains highly repetitive sequence or supergenes region in <laughs> known model species. The second part of the question. <laughs> yeah, okay. So actually where I'm going to is going in the direction of rep repetitive protein. So you can already go from that. Uh, and uh, also maybe what I will introduce uh, later with our resource maybe also helps. Otherwise, uh, when I finish the talk, we can we can discuss that if I don't answer uh, the question. Perfect, um, thank you. So from the structural perspective, we wanted to look at also like, what are, are the novelties there, right? Now we have all of these predicted structures and we know that there are proteins of a non-function there. Uh, could they also correspond to new folds or do they have predicted folds that, from which, that are similar to proteins of non-function? So we could learn from those folds. Of course, we could do that using uh, Martin's and, and, and Pedro's resource, uh, but we, we went in another direction and uh, we um, used, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I have everything in front of me. I'm just going to, uh, I, um, I have a lot of, so the, yeah, there was the zoom bar and then the images were in front, I could not see my slides. Uh, but anyway, now, now, now I can. So uh, what we did was to use, to look at um, unusual, uh, try to develop, uh, de develop the way to look for uh, unusual folds. Uh, based on local structure uh, um, um, representations and their distributions. So uh, Janani was a, uh, another postdoc in, in the group. Uh, she developed a way that uh, takes the protein structure and breaks the structure into uh, overlapping substructures within a sphere. So per amino acid, it goes through the amino acid in the sliding window and breaks that into within a sphere, um, uh, breaks it into a, a super secondary structure element, basically. And then uh, she trained the network with construct contrastive learning that uh, uses all of these structural fragments to um, and discretize them into 1020, one of 1024 uh, shape merge. So it's basically uh, this network uh, uses constructs, contrastive learning to convert the structural um, representation into an alphabet uh, of with 1,024 1, elements. And then you can see um, these um, shape merge, so these words, shape merge, as words in a text. So these are shape merge in a protein structure. And then uh, each protein is represented by the average of this shape merge representations. And so then you can use this shape merge representation, which is a fixed length vector, and compare it with the distribution of shape merge representations in the protein data bank. So if a protein has a shape merge representation that it looks like the shape merge representation of things we see in the PDB, then this would be common in the PDB and it would be an inlier. But if it doesn't look like those in the PDB, it would be an outlier. And so here, this is very useful, for example, to detect a diverse set of exceptions that you can find in the PDB. One of them is highly repetitive proteins. So that uh, goes into the question that was just asked. So in the PDB, we know that there's not so many repetitive proteins and also when you have a repetitive protein, the number of repetitive units can 
just basically amplify, especially if it's an open-ended repeat. And so you would expect that the, the shape mirror representation of highly repetitive proteins will be very different from those that we see in the PDB. So these will highlight, will be highlighted a lot as outliers. Um, but other cases are also all, uh, obligate oligomers. So alpha fold, the, in the alpha fold database, you only have proteins modeled a single chain. But we know that there are proteins that actually they need partners uh, to adopt the, the, the correct oligomeric state, the correct structure. And so if you have such cases, you would expect that the predicted structure would not look so well, so much as you see in the PDB. But you also have fragments for the same reason of repetition of repetitive proteins where the, comp the number of the same um, uh, uh, structure shapers would vary a lot in fragments, in, in proteins that are fragments of other proteins, the structural representation of the fragment would look very different from the expected real structure. So these would also be um, highlighted as outliers, but we also have novel folds and we could find all of these cases in our network, especially uh, in the case of novel folds, we're really excited to see these new predicted fold, which we call the beta flower, uh, which are just these beta barrels, repetitive beta barrels that we could find with a different number of air pin repeats uh, from four to six. And when we look at the structure, it really looks like a flower because there's a long loop um, that makes it look like a petal. And we saw that uh, actually most of our set uh, in our atlas is um, it's bright, it's an in layer. Uh, but we have clusters of, of outliers uh, that fall into all of these categories. Uh, but still, when comparing darkness distribution between inliers and outliers, we saw there's much more darkness in the outliers, in the structural outliers, than the inliers. Now, this we found this to be a very useful network. And so we made a resource uh, with the support of, of SIB, which we call the Protein Universe Atlas, which is an interactive version of this network that you can uh, play with. Uh, this is a video that I will not explain in detail, uh, but basically you can you can see the different kinds of annotations over the network. You can query by Uniprod AC, you can input your structure, so search for structurally similar proteins, you can input your sequence, and this will also then uh, allow you to download all of the data associated to the unique uh, nodes that uh, where your your matches fall, as you can see here, like you have uh, the a table and you you can export. Now, what's the next steps? So of course, we're not stopping here. This this was just the starting of of a really interesting line of research, in my opinion. Uh, but now there's a lot of things that we can improve on. And we're working on that direction. And currently, one of them is to improve on the network and on the way that we construct the network. Uh, so as I said, for constructing the network, we used MM6, which is a classic homology-based approaches approach. But we can also use a leverage language models to try to get more homology than where we can get with MM6. And here, uh, Lorenzo, which is a PhD student in the group, is leveraging the intermediate representations that language models provide for, for, uh, for proteins to uh, detect remote homology relationships. So if you remember from the morning, uh, what language models typically do, protein language models typically do, is they take a protein sequence and then convert each residue, embed each residue into an intermediate representation, which are rep per residue embeddings. Uh, what we could do would be, again, as for the structural outlier uh, method, we could average everything and then have a fixed length uh, uh, vector for each protein. Uh, but we found out that to find homolo remote homologies, this averaging method is not the most, uh, it's not the best one to do. Uh, so what we do instead of what Lorenzo is doing uh, is to develop a method where if you have two proteins you want to compare and you have the per residue embeddings of each of them, you can construct a per residue uh, embedding, dis embedding vector distance matrix. So you basically would expect that residues that are 
in the same sequence and structural context and so they that could be related so they don't need to be exactly the same amino acid they can just have be a different amino acid but have the same kind of context that emerged through evolution you would expect that in this space uh, in this embedding space they would either be close to each other or their embeddings would be correlated so you can compute this, this per residue distance metrics uh, that then can be leveraged to score the similarity between the two proteins. And so Lorenzo took this matrix, um, tweaked it a bit, added some, some normalization to, to the distances, and was able to come up with EBA, which is the embedding based alignment method, to score the possibility of two proteins to, uh, to be similar or not. Um, and here are examples on how uh, uh, the power of the method. So in on the left, we have the comparison between proteins that have a very low sequence similarity, below 30% sequence uh, similarity, but have the same structure, so the same fold. And you can see here that there's a clear diagonal in the matrix that corresponds to a very high score uh, or a very low distance in the space. Uh, but if you have proteins where the sequence similarity is really low, still lower than 30%, but a completely different structure, then you don't see these this diagonals. Uh, and then here in the middle, you have one case where you have a share of, of, of motif. So it's a protein. So this case is actually repetition of the same motif, but still the proteins have lower than 30% sequence identity. Uh, and you see the two diagonals and you see the two proteins full, uh, so overlap really well. Um, then when benchmarked uh, for um, label uh, transfer, and this is, is in transferring of the, so if you have two proteins, you have your target protein and you want to know if it belongs to the same family, uh, fold family as another protein, um, we could see that EVA uh, has a, is very accurate and has much higher performance than MM6. MM6 is, has a really lower performance, uh, but EVA, although it's a sequence-based method, it, it really competes with the uh, state-of-the-art structure-based method, uh, especially when the normalization that, that Lorenzo implemented is there. If it's just a simple distance in the embedding space, you have much lower performance. Uh, and you can also see that EBA is slightly better than full seek, which is a structure-based method. So we are confident that now using EBA over the pairs of proteins where we didn't find any similarities with MM6, that we are going to find much more remote homology relationships than we had before. And so we can improve on the landscape that we constructed. So with this, I'm finished. And uh, I hope I could convince you that now, thanks to the deep learning revolution, we are closer than ever to exploring uncharted territory of the protein universe. And that uh, AlphaFold, thanks to, to the uh, huge success of the, of the AlphaFold method, uh, we can now have structural information, at least high accurate structural information for many of those hypothetical unknown proteins that actually correspond to new biology. And now we can leverage that to learn more about what they do. And that our network uh, approach really helps us to more easily pinpoint those cases um, and uh, prioritize cases for experiment. And with it also that automated annotation is a really tricky task and it requires a combination of methods and approaches. So I want to thank you. I want to thank Patricia for, invited, uh, for inviting me to, to present about our work and to you for listening. And of course, to the entire Schwede group uh, for helping me with the work and um, hosting me in this work uh, and to our collaboration, collaborators that contributed a lot for this work to, to, to be so, so impactful. Thank you very much.